will go live much sooner than I normally do. I think that's a bad tech. That's probably bad form when, um, you know, like if I was to run a TV show and people expect it to be Thursdays at 830, the dream spot when I was a kid, then just starting it at eight would be like bad news. It'd be no bueno. And yet here I am doing it. Boy, I'm just looking at my page. We have. Uh, there's a lot of stuff with a, not a lot of comments. I think uh, the algorithm is is stuffing me down. And also, I think people are getting tired of the way my assistant is posting the request for topics because we don't get a lot of, uh, I've not gotten very many responses to those lately. Hello, Grimby. Come on in. Come on in, Grimby. Just finished this coffee. I'm just going to close this door. Grimby, come over here so people can see you. There's Grimby. Look at that. Come right here. Can you see these people here? Look, there's people. Okay, whatever. Close that door. Now he's in here. Oh, yeah. Get ourselves situated. That's what I'm talking about. I'll refresh, make sure that this is coming through on my feed. So notwithstanding that we... Hey, Ruth, nice to see you. Notwithstanding, we don't have too many topics. Look, see now Grimby over here is like, oh, no, what have I done? For those of you that are only on audio, my dog has a habit of coming into my office because he wants to be a part of all the fun. Let's go. Come on, get out. Get you, you were going to look at that door. That's not on me. Comes into my office because he wants to be a part of the fun and then realizes there's no way out and then decides that I need to let him out. And so this is the game that Grimby and I play with one another. It's it's boring, but it's a part of my life. So uh, where'd my topics go? That's funny. Facebook hit them from me this time. Oh, and it wants me to close unused applications because our FPS is never good. Has anyone else noticed that with lives? It's gotten really bad. It seems to um, wobble in and out. So I just have to close all this stuff down. That's OK. Close that. I'll close that. I don't need mail open. And I don't think I need uh, Safari open either. So we'll close that down. OK. We're running lean and smooth. Ruth, this is a great time. You are the sole viewer right now. So if you have anything you want me to touch on, if you've got like a question, you know, something going on in your practice, something not going on in your practice, let me know. This is the time to bring it because I will give you my full undivided attention. While you ponder that generous gift, I'm going to pour this tea live. Good evening, Maria. Nice to see you. You're just in time for the live pouring of the tea. That tea looks a bit of a suspect color, doesn't it? I don't know if I steeped it long enough. Five minutes. Usually you got to pour some out and it sort of swirls around. So this week I've been off. Yeah, good teapot, right? Maria's just saying she loves this teapot. Uh, Bay gave this to me as a Christmas present one year. It's got a dragon on it, as you can see. It's very heavy. It's made of cast iron, so you could use it in uh, combat if you had to. Like if there is a zombie apocalypse, that's my weapon. If someone comes into my house, you know, and you're like, ah, where's the weapon? This teapot is the one I use for self-defense. We're going to light this lamp to begin our ritual. This, uh, this week I've been off, but as I had promised, there's been a lot going on. And uh, one of the things that I've been doing, which I'm going to talk about briefly here, is attending a... Uh, a program called Essence of Mastery, which is, uh, I'm attending it because I hold a credential with the International Coach Federation. And as part of holding a credential, you have to do thing, you have to get things called continuing education units. So as a lawyer, you had to go do this. As a, uh, a project manager, I think you had to go do this, if I remember correctly. As you know, an accountant, you often have to go do this. And so this is the way that certifying bodies ensure that people aren't just like, you know, they got their, their thing 40 years ago and are now just sort of entrenched. They're not learning. They're not progressing. They're not moving with the tide of, of society and all of that stuff. So it's a required part of what I do. And the trouble with most of these things, and in my experience from most professions, so like law, I, I, the way I would experience these things for lawyers is I would go with my principal, we'd sit down, he would be lecturing or something at it, you know, offering something. And you'd have a lot of people with their heads down while the person was speaking, working on something because they're very busy and they don't have time for this. And most of this stuff is 
it's fine, but it's pretty um, mundane and um, kind of superficial and it doesn't really move the needle. It is just like kind of light education is how we could call it. And consequently, people show up and then very quickly they're like, mm. so um, the person that mentored me in um, getting my certification was putting on or taking part. She was a guest for part of this program called Essence of Mastery, which puts its focus on like mastery in coaching. What does that look like? What does it look like for mastery and leadership? And I thought, okay, cool. Well, I've got to get some of these credits anyhow. Let's take this one on and we'll see how it is. So I'll share a little bit about um, uh, what that was like. It'll be one of the first things we talk about. We're going to talk about um, being a leader versus actually developing someone's leadership and the distinction between those two um, and why most people want to run to the second, to developing leadership in other people and how that messes them up why we have so many people trying to develop your leadership without actually having their own leadership developed. Andrew Mundy brought a great question about um, finances, financial objections and stuff. So we'll talk about that. And then we've got the leadership lightning round where I'm going to jam on uh, just a bunch of um, sort of small, quick topics. This is uh, growing out of the fact that I've been doing uh, TikTok videos. My my team is like, you got to you got to do shorter, smaller stuff. We need you on TikTok, Adam. Come on. People aren't watching hour long, hour and a half long lives. <laughs> I'm like, but I but I like doing those. Well, we need you on TikTok, Adam. And so I've been faced with this challenge, which is how do I provide value? How do I convey something that actually causes leadership? in a minute rather than something that just contributes to the noise and the noise and the irrelevancy and the just the droning you know the the pop psychology kind of superficial someone posting an image of like servant leader versus boss leader and and everyone likes it but nothing really changes like i don't want to do that and so a minute is very little time how do I how do I convey something that is actually going to make a difference for someone? Hello, Grimby. And so uh, we're just going to do this dance a few more times. Actually, what's going to happen? Come on, let's go. You're going to go this way. Yep, that's right. Get out of here. Yep. And we move this, and there we go. All right. Whew. It's tough work having a dog. It's really putting me through my uh, my motions today. So I've got a few. Uh, Leadership quickies we'll be going through about four um, just to break those apart, do some work with those. So uh, let's take a sip of tea and then we'll talk about the essence of mastery. So the essence of mastery, this summit that I've been doing for the last three days was it started at seven in the morning, which is crazy early for me. Not to be up, but just to be on a call. That's that's early. I don't usually start calls until 10 a.m. Very intentionally. So um, early starts and um, it started, I was very inspired, really um, excited. It, it seemed, you know, my mentor, along with two other really masterful coaches, were talking about mastery and distinguishing stuff. As um, the summit went on, I started to feel... Uh, less inspired and more like this was a review. It felt a lot like a review of some of the work that I'd already done to get the credential that I hold. And so it was a little bit disappointing. Um, one of the things that I did learn, though, or, or did have reiterated that I want to share is um, the sneakiness with which we assume and impose our own perspective onto the people we're working with, be it as a coach or as a leader. So the heart of masterful coaching, masterful leadership is really, really, really trusting the person over there in their own process. That that sounds great when it's just a sound bite. You know, when it's just a word, just trust yourself in your process. Oh yeah, cool. I totally, I totally trust this person in their process. We say those words because it sounds good and because Adam or whoever told us to just trust the other person in the process. 
but like everything that sounds good when we say it is much harder in practice. So I want to offer a couple examples of how our ego subtly or not so subtly imposes our own beliefs and stuff and, and gets in the way of trusting our client. So one of those examples would be if you were working with someone, Hey, Andrew, <laughs> thank you. These are all from onion. Andrew, <clears throat> these shirts, Andrew says he likes my shirts. Anion makes all their clothes here in Victoria. I think they have factories somewhere else, but, and they're all recycled wool and they all fit fantastic. So if you want to support a local business that does just exquisite work, I recommend checking out Anion, A-N-I-A-N. They're fantastic. I really like their products and their philosophy. Very sustainable, their approach. I mean, reusing textiles, we need more of that, right? With fast fashion, textiles just piling up. So they're, they're pulling that out. It's really good. So an example, we've got people that are um, someone that we're working with. Imagine we're either coaching them or we're leading them and we're in this conversation with them and, you know, they might go like, well, I'm just, oh, Jack keeps doing this thing, whatever. I'm not going to give you any more context than that. Now, what most of us would just, without even thinking, we'd go, uh, Oh, okay, well, I hear that you're frustrated and I understand and it makes sense and blah, 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 blah. And so what we've done is we've heard the client or the, the report express something and then we've jumped, we've connected the dot in our own mind. We've said, oh, well, he sighed or she sighed and said, oh, Jack's just doing the thing. To me, that sounds like frustration. And then we give that to the client. We give them, oh, I can really hear that you're frustrated. Sounds super kind, super caring, oh, so empathetic. But what that does is it imposes my interpretation onto what happened. And so real masterful work would be to step over nothing and to assume nothing. I heard that sound, I heard a sound, I've got an interpretation of what that sound means. When I make that sound, it usually means that I'm feeling judgmental and frustrated. But who am I to know what that sound means for this person in front of me? That client might use that sound for any number of reasons. And so for the truly masterful approach that really puts a great deal of trust in the client's process, we would simply go, hmm, I heard you make a sound there. What, what did that sound mean? What did that sigh mean? I noticed you sighed. Tell me about that sigh. So we really, hopefully you can see just in this really simple example, the level of nuance that this can start to take on where without even realizing it with the best of intentions, with absolutely an open heart and a commitment to have this person feel better and to move them through whatever's going on, that we can start to impose stuff. And what we don't realize is that when, you, when someone is thrashing about in water, metaphorically, you know, when we're like, ah, things suck, we're desperate for lifeline. We have a hard time trusting ourselves and the world has a hard time trusting us. And so as soon as you give someone anything like that, as soon as you impose your worldview, your perspective, your thoughts, your whatever onto them, they're not going to go, hey, that's an imposition. They might, but typically they won't. Typically they'll just grab it. They'll grab on to anything because they feel to themselves like they're flailing around in the water. This is an assumption I'm making, but follow with me. And so without you or the client realizing it, very quickly, you move from totally trusting their process and supporting them to develop deeper trust in their own process to them subtly starting to look to you to interpret what's going on for them subtly having them look to you to help them understand what's happening internally rather than supporting them to get better and better at understanding themselves what's going on internally. That's really subtle stuff, or at least it, it, it is to me. Like that's, we're, we're getting in pretty fine tooth. Um, but what really catches me over and over and over again, I'm gonna give you another example, but what catches me over and over and over again is that, um, that requires a tremendous amount of trusting our client. 
It requires trusting that even though this person's flailing and feels in distress and is frustrated, or so we believe, I'm going to trust that they don't need me to rescue them. I'm going to trust that they don't need me to come in and sort this out for them. I'm going to trust that they've got everything they need. And I'm going to trust myself and this process I'm in as a leader or a coach that it's okay if they end this conversation frustrated and stay frustrated for a week and then come back because maybe that's a part of their process. So all of this stuff, hopefully you're kind of getting when people start this journey, taking on coaching and leadership, especially when they try to do it without any training and without any support of their own coach, it's really fraught because it's really hard to trust people in that often because we haven't had the experience of being trusted ourselves. We haven't had someone working with us who stays off the court that way, who just trusts us, lets us be there kind of frustratingly while we flail about and are like, well, just tell me what I need to know. It's often what's happening when someone comes to a coach and says, I want to figure out what I want. They like the secret desire is that the coach is ideally just going to tell them what they want or to have some magical list that will walk through that will then the list will tell you what you want. You'll do the exercise and the exercise will tell you what you want rather than learning to discover what you want through a process of choice. And then how did that choice go? I didn't like that at all. That's not what I want. Now I have to choose again. So really, really subtle, challenging stuff. I'll give another example in one sec here. Andrew saying that listening and feeling beyond the words that are being spoken from a neutral space, it's such a beautiful space, place, and opens up whole new possibilities of conversation. Yeah, it really does. I, I'm amazed how subtle my um, my own ego just gets to the point where it's like, ah, uh, this person really needs me to save them. And then like, I'm just going to give them this thing. I'm just going to give them that one extra thing and, and developing the threshold to stand back, stand back, stand back and be with people struggling and to feel the empathetic pain over here of someone struggling and be all right. Like be able to just let that sit. That takes training and capacity and practice. One person in the group, as we were talking about this, we were debriefing after, um, after watching a coaching conversation they were sharing like, oh, I, uh, I noticed I was good for like 10 minutes. But then after 10 minutes, I was like, okay, we got to get somewhere. And uh, the same thing happened on a call Bay and I were reviewing in the forge where the, the coach was just doing beautiful work for 20 minutes. It's a half hour call for 20 minutes. They were really like leaning back energetically and physically. They didn't need the client to get anywhere. And you could tell at the 10 minute mark, the coach, it's like a switch flipped. And they're like, but we got 10 minutes. We got to make something happen. Lean forward. Let's do some doing. Let's bring in some stuff. Let's get this person moving forward. So we all have a threshold. It's not a bad thing to have a threshold. It's just human nature. Everyone has a threshold. You can lift weights your whole life. You're going to have a threshold for what you can lift. And it's important to know our thresholds so that we can practice at it and practice moving beyond it and practice having grace with ourselves when we reach it and get st like stopped, stuck, caught there. Um, one other example of this was a coach I was watching was setting up a conversation with someone at first and they said, they asked the client, you know, hey, is there, we've got people watching. I recognize that can be a little weird. Is there anything you need to feel comfortable with this conversation? You know, given we've got confidentiality, but like, you know, there's people watching. Is there anything you need? And the client sort of thought and was like, mm, no, you know, I, I really trust this. I feel really good. I think I'm, I'm good. And um, a couple of people in the chat uh, put in like, well, I think what we could all do for the benefit of the client is we could all turn our video off, which you know, that'd be a, a fine idea, right? Seems very helpful, but it's worth just noticing that's another place where we subtly stop trusting the client to ask her what they need. In our attempts to be helpful to someone, we actually circumvent trusting them. I am helping you because you wouldn't know to ask for this on your own. I am helping you because you, I don't trust that you will get there and I can support you to have this go better than if I just trust you. So these are 
really challenging, nuanced places where mastery is elusive for us because when we are helping, when we hold it like we're helping or being helpful or being kind or whatever, we become more attached and it's harder to receive feedback about it because we we jump to like, well, I'm just trying to be helpful. I'm just trying to serve this person. I'm just trying to help them out. Yes, yes, that is what you are doing. It's in the way of the next level of your own mastery. What are you saying, Andrew? Andrew says, I've had the opportunity to be in conversation as of late where the person I'm talking to is stuck and really struggling. In the past, I would have looked at how to move them forward. And these days I've been holding space to be with them in it and support them to be at choice where they want to go. Yeah, that's the work is we let people struggle. We don't need them to stop struggling. We don't shift them off of struggling. We're okay if they struggle. Sometimes the crazy thing about leadership and coaching is that people need to struggle for like weeks, months. Can we be okay with that? Can we trust their process? That, that requires a lot. And Ruth, you're saying, I manage someone in my other job that I struggle to trust. They swing from enthusiasm and really trying to prove themselves to doing poor work and not communicating. Example, not letting me or others know whether they are or can do something. They often think that their work is better than it is, and they get a sense of around feedback and constructive criticism. Oof, that's tough. I find it hard not to micromanage them. There is more to this. My question is around, how do you balance sitting back and letting them go through their own process and making sure the job gets done? Well, so you've got a number of things there, Ruth. That is really challenging, right? You've got someone who it sounds like they've got a pattern, a pendulum, you know, that you're leading. And the pendulum is to be like, almost like overly enthusiastic. I can do it all. I can do it all. And then underneath the surface, what I would imagine is happening is they get super excited. They take on a bunch of stuff and then they get overwhelmed, ashamed, probably have this thought in their head, like, fuck, I've done it again. I've taken on too much. I knew this was going to happen. And here I am with too much on my plate and I'm going to let people down. And so that brings up a bunch of shame. And then from their shame, they go to the other side where they hide out. They don't want to tell people because they're ashamed. They keep it to themselves. They try to get on top of it, but they don't. And of course, no, none of this is on the surface, not out in the open. Shame keeps it hidden. So that's what's kind of happening underneath the surface. And that's really tough. The other thing I'm hearing is that they're, it's hard for them to receive feedback. And so uh, we'll, we'll talk kind of what, what there is to do as a leader, but like until we can offer someone feedback, it's really hard for anything to happen, right? Like if I'm doing some stuff that's in the way of my leadership, but every time you say, Adam, I'd like to offer you feedback on your leadership, I just plug my ears and go la, 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 really loudly. Um, that's, that's kind of an extreme, ridiculous example, but energetically, a lot of us do that. We're just more subtle rather than it'd be easier if we just plugged our ears and screamed, cause then that's out there on the table. It's really obvious what's happening. We do it more subtly, more energetically, more, more mentally, more emotionally. And so that's the first thing we have to take on. If I'm just plugging my ears every time you want to give me feedback on my impact as a leader, then I'm never going to learn about my impact as a leader other than through my own eyes. And my own eyes are um, inherently constrained by my own blind spots. So I'll be able to see my impact as a leader inside of the walls of what I can already see, and I won't be able to see anything new. So it's kind of like, that approach right to feedback is great if you don't want to improve if you don't want to change and if no one around you requires that you change if there's no need for anything to go differently great but that's not really the world that we tend to operate in and most of us if we get down deep enough have a desire to improve to grow to move things beyond just let's just keep doing the exact same thing and iterate on that and you know and then i guess we die and we go to heaven and things are different and better there no, <laughs> make them better now. Let's have them better today. So that's the first place. As a leader, we have to begin with someone's inability to receive feedback. And so the way that I would approach this or coach someone who is leading to approach this would be to begin working with um, that, with the feedback. And so there's two parts to that. First, there's the person we've been talking about who has a relationship to feedback and probably themselves, right? If my relationship to myself is I'm a worthless piece of crap and I'm always fucking up, then 
any feedback that comes to me is going to get filtered through that lens, right? You could be like, Adam, I want to tell you you're doing a great job. And, and I have a story. My listening is I'm a worthless piece of crap and I'm always fucking up. Then I'm going to receive your positive feedback. Probably it's going to get distorted to like Ruth's telling me I'm doing a good job, but I know I'm a worthless piece of crap and I'm always fucking up. So I know she's telling me I'm doing a good job, but it's just a matter of time before she tells me how I suck. So I'm going to steal myself. Yeah. Thank you for the po I'm good. I appreciate the positive feedback. Ruth hit me with the stuff I need to know. So it just, you know, that relationship that this person has to themselves and to receiving feedback is going to be really in the way. And so what there is to, to do there is one, we want to acknowledge that and work with that. But before we do any of that, we want to look on our, our side of the fence and get squeaky clean with this. And what that requires in our own leadership is to take a look and be like, where am I uh, colluding with this person's crappy story? Where do I have a little bit of myself that's like, this person is a worthless piece of crap and they're always fucking up. And it may be nicer. It may sound much kinder. It may sound lovely. Or you may not even let yourself hear that voice that you have, which is part of the challenge of leadership. Is we got to get honest with ourselves. We really got to like take a look and, and honestly like root out, like where is that judgmental part of myself? Because I'm a human. And given that I'm a human, I know I've got judgment. So what's the judgment I'm holding on this person? We got to work through that. We got to bring that to our coach and get supported and like, hey, I got a bunch of judgment about how this person's not showing up. And the work with your coach is probably going to, your coach is going to help you see like, well, you know, what is that, where in your own life does that sort of thing show up? How do you, how do you bring that same kind of judgment to yourself? Well, I would never, ever let myself ever drop the ball. Great. So this person drops the ball and you judge them for that. And you've learned to solve that by making sure you never drop the ball. Because if you did, you would judge yourself the same way you're judging her. Can you see how these are, you're kind of like the yin to her yang. Great. So we work through it so we can actually start to see our judgment and then release our judgment. Only once we've done that, can we come back to this person? We're going to call her uh, Judith. And so, um, hey, Andrea, nice to see you. Until I've worked through my own judgment, until I've had the courage, until I've done the hard work to bring my judgment to my own consciousness, looked at it, and done the hard work to set it down, anytime I come to Judith and bring her feedback, it's my feedback, two things are going to happen. First, my feedback is going to get tainted by my own judgment. So no matter how nice, how kind I'm going to be, my own judgment of Judith is going to show up energetically in the feedback I'm giving her. And then two, her story about herself is then going to taint my feedback even further. So we can't change Judith's story about herself. We can support her to change it. Hey, Angela. But we can't change it ourselves. We can help her see her story and work through it. But again, we can't change that. What we can change, what we do have power over as a leader, is our own judgment, our own story. So that's where we bring the work. Work ourselves out, then come to Judith. And at Judith, we would say, hey, Judith, I really, here's how I would approach this. I would, I would say, I'd, I'd really like to support you in developing your leadership. I really, I see some possibility for you. I think there's something available here. Are you open to that? And Judith, hopefully, if you've enrolled her in who she is, will be like, yeah. And from there, I would probably say, okay, great. So there's something I'd like to reflect to you, just so you can see it. Not because it's wrong or anything, but just so you can be aware of, of its impact and how it's going. And the thing I want to reflect is I notice every time you get feedback, you get really defensive and it really starts to be like you kind of get defensive and self-critical and like push it away. And I would go really slowly through this. Are you aware of that? And almost certainly Judith will probably be, she'll either maybe be a bit aware, a bit aware or not at all. And quite likely she'll get defensive because you're giving her feedback in this moment. And so as she gets defensive, we want to be really loving and be like, I notice it's happening now. Like, can you feel a closure in your body? Can you feel what's going on internally for yourself? So that we're supporting Judith to start to see this thing that exists in her blind spot and allow her in those moments of closure when she gets feedback to stand with her and help her see like, hey, can you feel closure in your body? Can you notice it over here? It feels like you're really closing up so that then in the moment she can start to open back up. She can unfold in the face of that. 
That's how we would work with this. And what that'll do is it allow slowly with your support, Judith, to start to open and receive feedback without shutting down. This, to be clear, is a long process. This isn't like a one and done, I did it, why isn't Judith solved? Because that's not how this works. So this is something you work with Judith and it's like her going to the gym and lifting a two pound weight. The trainer doesn't go, have you lift a two pound weight? And then when you next show up and be like, what the fuck, why aren't you lifting 50 pound weights? I showed you how to do this, you should already be there. No, the trainer knows two pound weight, probably two and a half pound weight next, maybe stay at the two pound weight and you build from there. So that's the kind of journey you're in with Judith. Let me know how that lands, Ruth. <clears throat> While you do, I'm going to read what everyone else wrote. So Andrew writing, uh, that feels edgy. How long can I be with someone in their struggle? Hours and days, maybe even a few weeks. Sure, past that feels painful. Yeah. Consider sometimes when we work with coaching clients long term, sometimes it's like six months of them struggling. You know, I had a client, it took him six months before he was willing to say what he wanted. The first six months up to that were him kind of frustrated with himself that he wasn't making the best use of the coaching, which would be kind of like getting frustrated with yourself that you're not using the best use of your um, tour guide when you aren't able to tell the tour guide where you want to go. Oh, I bought this map and it's not working. And you show up and you're like, ah, it's not working map. How do I make the best use of you? And if map could talk to you, like choose a fucking destination. <laughs> That's how you use me without a destination, just, just a bunch of weird lines and blue and all that stuff. So six months that that person took, and I of course reflected this to them, but it took them six months before they actually were like, fuck it, this is what I wanna create. Uh, Maria says, I think the number one reason that managers don't want to give their employees feedback is because they lack the confidence to do so. Many managers simply don't know how to give feedback. There's always a deep rooted reason why feedback is hard to receive for some. Yeah. Well, I definitely think that's one of the reasons, Maria. Um, there's a, a few like, uh, well, I'll share, uh, honor your perspective. I'll share mine. Um, a few thoughts come up as you share that. The first one is I'm always, I'm really, uh, I try to caution myself about number one reasons because then I start to be like, oh, this is the reason. And if I know why, if I have a number one reason why stuff happens, that pulls me out of the moment with the human being I'm in front of. So maybe the number one reason managers don't want to give a feedback is because of the confidence, but the person I'm in front of, I don't know any of their story. And further, the more I'm like, I know the number one reason, the harder it's going to be for me to just be like, I wonder what about giving feedback is challenging for this person. So you may be right. And at least for me, I find when I start to be like, this is the number one reason, here's the number one thing, you know, the internet loves number one reasons, top 10 things. That is a bit challenging because it can start to take away from our capacity to truly lead in the moment. Now we're not leading so much in the moment, we're leading from the, the knowledge of the number one reason. So that's the first one, first thought I have. Um, I think you're right that many managers simply don't know how to give feedback. And I would say most of us don't. We're not trained in that. So most people I experience that really think they're good at giving feedback aren't. And it's not because they're stupid or, or don't understand or anything. It's just because most of this work is delivered educationally and informationally rather than ontologically. So what that means is that you're trained to give feedback by following like an algorithm or an approach. Say the nice thing, then say the thing that's whatever, then honor them for whatever. That's fine and good, but who are you being underneath all of that? Do you have judgment as you're saying the nice thing? And then blah, 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 blah. And if you do, all of what you do is going to come to the lens of your judgment and then land inside their story. And so um, I, I agree. Many managers don't know how to give feedback, but then I would go even further and say, most of us don't know. It's just not something that we're very well trained in. And we don't really know how to receive it either. The reason none of us really are able or very facile at receiving feedback is because the world is set up in right and wrong. Like from the moment we come out of that womb, we're trained in this lens that like that's the right way to be and that's the wrong way to be. And our parents don't have to do much for that. It's just energetic. We receive it. And we're like, oh, God, it, the right thing for me to do is to not spill the milk. The wrong thing for me to do is to throw my food on the floor. Got it. And then before we know it, 
we're 13 or we're 20 or we're 40 and we're judging people for throwing the food on the floor and we're we're judging people positively for not spilling the milk and all of that stuff so this idea of things being right or wrong gets ingrained in us very quickly and then that becomes the lens through which all of our feedback is received everything we get from someone that is providing us feedback is like fuck i was wrong for that ah, i'm right for that and that makes us very attached to like our listening becomes about what did i do right or how did i fuck up instead of what could i notice in terms of my impact here what might there be to uh to like to grow from here or something along those lines and um last thing you say maria is there's always a deep-rooted reason my feedback is hard to receive for some yeah deep-rooted reason for all of us and it always makes sense if you go down far enough, far enough, fur enough, I was going to say further, if you dig deep enough, there's always a reason why someone's challenged by something and it always makes sense. The seduction to that is then it becomes really fascinating to be like, but why is this reason here? And what does this mean? And oh my God, let's spend the next 10 years looking at that. What I think about coaching and leadership is we don't have to look at that. We can go back to the past to figure out how you got here if we need to. But for the most part, we can just acknowledge, great, it's challenging for you to receive feedback. What are you making that feedback mean that I suck? Great, let's address that story. Okay, but why do I feel that I suck? I don't know, probably because your dad did something with your mom and your brother also did something at the same time. Your teachers were this way. Now, let's move past that story. You came by it honestly, but that's the least interesting part in terms of what you're up to in your life. What's more interesting is what you want to create from moving beyond this story. Shall we move this story? Like, shall we look through that lens? Hey, Carol, nice to see you. I This is an early edition. I'm on holiday, so I decided to start early. Uh, I, want to, I want to respond to what you said. It's a great comment. I'm just going to go through these in order. So Ruth um, saying, thanks, Adam, that does land. I found myself swinging from compassionate judgments about her crappiness. <laughs> I love the way you worded that. I'll explore my own judgments about myself before her one to one next week. Yeah. Yeah. And the more we can see someone with compassion, the whole premise of who do you think you are is that most of us, when we attempt to lead people, what we're psychically present to, like intellectually, is just what's on the surface. And what's on surface is the crappy things that the person's doing, their crappiness, as Ruth brilliantly put it. So they're super enthusiastic and I don't buy it, or they're flaky and they're hiding out and it's fucking annoying. And then we try to lead from that place. So our leadership ultimately becomes about fixing what's broken about this person. The model and approach in who do you think you are is who is this person underneath those things on the top? Who is this person at the heart, at their core? Without any fear, how is this person on this planet showing up from their highest and greatest and most loving, beautiful self? We lead from that place. So if we can hold them that way, oh, this person's commitment. But when commitment gets scared, it overcommits to try to compensate for being afraid of not being committed enough, takes on way too much, gets super enthusiastic, then feels burdened by its commitment, freaks out, feels ashamed, runs over and becomes kind of flaky and tries to throw stuff off its plate. So ironically, even though who this person is at their core is commitment, the way they're showing up on the surface is flaky and uncommitted and then burdened and overwhelmed with commitments and then flaky and uncommitted. So if we can start to lead by relating to the person through that lens and start to provide our feedback from holding them intellectually that way, magic happens and you become the sort of leader that sees and calls forward a part of people, really their deepest core self, that no other leader does. Because what most leadership does is focus on the part above the surface that we can see, and that's the crappy behaviors. So most leadership attempts and coaching attempts are largely remedial and aimed at the surface, the superficial. Carol. Am I saying your name right? It looks like Carol. Your name looks French or Quebecois, Carol Roberge. I, I would put a, or it could just be Carol Roberge. You tell me, let me know, Carol. Uh, Carol writes, hey, just popping up, didn't hear the beginning of the live, my bad. I have the feeling that not all feedback has the same value. It really depends on the story and achievements of the person providing the feedback. Um, I disagree. So I totally get where you're coming from. And um, 
Well, let's unpack that because I think it's really valuable in a conversation about feedback. So first, let's acknowledge what you're saying. Someone who's worked in the business for 40 years and is an expert in businessing is going to have probably more nuanced feedback that can provide me a lot more that's like more specific and can, you know, it's just to your point, maybe more valuable. And then someone who's been doing this for 10 days. I had a coach um, reach out to me from this um, mastery program that was like, hey, you seem like you've got lots of cool thoughts on coaching. And I thought maybe we could connect. I'm like, totally, let's do it. I'm always a clearing for connection. They're like, yeah, and we could like mentor each other back and forth. You could coach me and give me support and I could coach you. I'm less interested in that. There's nothing wrong with this person. It's a generous offer. I trust their heart. I've got a lot of support and I'm not looking for that kind of feedback from someone who's a lot greener, newer. So I think that's what you're speaking to, Kara. Like, you know, there's gradients here. So there is absolute truth to your point there. So I, I, I guess I want to change what I initially said when I read that. It's not that I disagree. It's that I want to broaden that and add some nuance and some caveats for us. So one, yes, different feedback, right? Like someone in the street uh, that is standing at the bus stop with you that's like, you're not very good at managing. <laughs> that's like the first part of the conversation with him. That feedback's not particularly helpful. Now, having said all that, one of the biggest barriers and obstacles to us developing our leadership and receiving feedback is our judgment and filtering of the feedback we receive. So this can sound many, many ways. One of the ways would be if you got feedback from me or someone, you go, mm, I appreciate, we always, we always caveat it, I appreciate the feedback Adam's given me. I just don't think he knows me. So m the feedback I'm offering you is being diminished by whatever reason you've created. Adam doesn't, doesn't know me. Oh, he's just seeing me show up in, in this way or I'm having a bad day. That's why he thinks that he's seen that or whatever. So all of those things allow you to take the feedback and diminish it, reduce its value or really more, more aptly its impact on you so that you don't really have to be in the confrontation of it. Anytime we get feedback, it kind of confronts us with something. Hey, here's how you're doing. Just like any time I get up in the morning and I look in front of the mirror and I'm like, God damn, I look old. <laughs> I look tired. I need to sleep more or whatever is going on. That's that's stark, right? We don't like that. Ah. So and we can diminish it. Oh, I just slept poorly. Oh, I just it allows us to push away from the starkness of just being presented with feedback about how we're showing up. So that's one of the ways we can do it. Another way is we can hierarchy we can hierarchically position ourselves so like well that's nice that adam gave me that feedback but he's only been in this business for five years and i've been in this business for eight years so i think i know better than him so his feedback doesn't really that matter that much or that's nice that he had that feedback for me but i'm the ceo of the company and he's just an employee and he just doesn't know all of the stuff that's going on so blah 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 so all of these provide ways for us to take feedback that comes in and then diminish it and eventually throw it out, not really let it make the difference for us. So we kind of have to play two games a little bit. One, we have to, we do have to do some, some checking to your point, Carol, where we check in like, Hey, am I a yes to this feedback? The best time to do that is before you get the feedback. When someone comes up and says, hey, I got feedback for you, that's the time to check. Am I a yes to this feedback? As soon as you get the feedback, it's really valuable for us all, this guy included, this guy especially, all to recognize the moment we get feedback, our ego is going to start to do the thing I just described because that's its job. Your ego's job is not to have you be open to feedback. Perish the thought. <laughs> Your ego's job is to say, dude, you're doing great. You're exactly where you need to be. Ignore this stuff that would call you forward to something beyond where you're currently at. And so we wanna first, hey, I got feedback for you. Are you open to it? Are you gonna receive this feedback? And once we do, then we really wanna take it in once we've said yes to it. Because that 
is where we can really let it in and feedback can make a difference. And it's going to be where we're at the crux of the moment where our ego is going to fight with us and be like, don't let it in. <laughs> and be like, eh, it's tough, but I kind of, I got, uh, I said I was going to let it in. I'm going to receive this. I'm going to allow that feedback to land. I have yet to work with someone. I've yet to experience myself and I've yet to work with someone that did not have all of the best intentions to receive feedback and get taken out when they received feedback. That's not a failing on their part. That's not a not being committed to leadership or having some insecurities they haven't addressed. That's really basic fundamental humanity showing up. And so as leaders, when we provide feedback to people, we really, we have to work with it. <clears throat> and we have to have a lot of grace for their capacity to receive it and support them to start to receive feedback differently. Um, Carol, you're following up saying, I'm saying that because I'm very aware that some people project their own insecurities when they provide feedback. Yes, absolutely. Remember we were talking, I don't know if you caught the conversation earlier, Ruth was talking about, you know, having feedback for this person. That's, hey, Darren, that's partially why we have to do our own work. We got to be responsible for our own work because we have insecurities. And the more insistent you are that you don't, the more I can insist that you do. You just can't see them. So we have our own stuff. That's why leaders that are really committed to leadership work with coaches so they can clear, they can scour out, you know, the stuff that gets stuck to the side, the edges of the pot so that they can then be a clean place to provide that feedback to people. And the, uh, the flip side to that is that the leader really committed to their growth checks in. Hey, is this a person off the street or is this a person with some feedback I'm willing to receive? Hey, they've been on my team for two months. Yeah, I'm going to receive their feedback. And then when they get that feedback, it's really easy. A great way to dismiss it to your point, Carol, is, well, that's all about them. That's their own insecurities, possibly. But the leader committed to developing their leadership is an alchemist. And what I mean by that is they take the garbage feedback, the, the lump of coal that they got from that person who's been working with them two months, that's laden with their insecurities and they scrub it. They take it and they, they clean it down until they have a piece like an ingot, a piece of gold or copper in this case left over that they can then use to better themselves. So that's really, that's a challenging aspect of leadership because a hundred percent, anytime we get feedback, there's going to be most people aren't in a working relationship with me or you or whoever's in this level of depth. They're just doing the very best they can. And, and so they're going to, they're, you're going to get some of their stuff along with the feedback they provide. And our job as leaders committed to our work is to take that feedback and transmute it into the gold that it is. Cause there is always gold in every piece of feedback, every piece of feedback. I really love that you, um, thank you, Carol. I really love that you um, put that comment into the chat. Really, really rich, so thank you. And um, thanks, Ruth. Thanks to Maria for um, for bringing all of that. You know, it's a really rich conversation. And Angela, thanks for, first of all, I love your friend's name, Claude de la Cluse. Claude de la Cluse. A clue is what, a nail? Is that right? Or is that a clue? A clue? A clue? Sounds kind of like a nail or something like that. Anyhow, that's a super cool name and I like it and I'm a little envious. Okay, uh, let's, Andrew's been generous enough to provide us with a topic. So we are gonna hit that topic. This one is um, a little more coachy leaning, but I promise you that this is an aspect of leadership too. So, um, Darren, I love what you were working on. Darren says, I'm working, Darren, a magnificent leader and coach in her own right. And, and Darren saying, I'm working on owning my impact, apologizing not just for their experience, right? I'm sorry you experienced it that way, but also for what they said I did to create it. So Darren's in the work, not just of being like, if someone says, Darren, I really felt you were judging me and I felt shut in the, and sh left out in the cold. The work Darren's taking on, or so I'm assuming Darren, is not just to be like, I'm sorry for your experience that I left you in the cold, but also to really take a look on her side and see where she can own that actually that was what she did. Where else? Okay, so their experience was I left them in the cold, and how did I contribute to that experience? 
So not, you know, those apologies, I'm sorry you feel that way. That's a great big fuck you. That's not an apology, right? There's no ownership there. I'm sorry your emotions are fucked up. If I could change and rewire your brain so you could be with a normal person like me, I would. I'm so sorry that I can't. No, don't apologize that way. Leaders apologize not just for what your experience was, but for how they contributed it to it. And we always have a way that we contributed it to it. So that is phenomenal work you're doing there. And I really acknowledge you for the, um, the, the leadership, responsibility, and courage it takes to do that. Because that is not our default human approach. Okay, so here's what Andrew's got for us. He says, I'd love some support in really understanding and getting to the core of an objection to someone working with me, specifically when it comes to finances. So any person selling anything would benefit from this. Let me change what I just said. Any person seeking to enroll people in something where part of what they're going to have to do to create that reality is commit some money. That's a, you might think that's a fancy way to talk about sales. I'm distinguishing it intentionally. But we're not going to go too much further down that. So anyone that's engaged in any kind of work where they have to enroll people in doing something. Hey, look, here's the benefit of having solar panels on your roof. But there's an investment up front. You've got to commit money up front. It's going to cost you something over 20 years. That money's going to come back to you. But so anyone engaged in any kind of thing like this will, will have this sort of situation. So Andrew says, you know, it's an area I'd say I'm weak in being supported in. When other objections come up, I don't have time. I don't I'm nervous about me being able to do this, whatever. Andrew says he stays flexible and can hang out and be impossibility with them. Whereas with financial ones, it feels very black and white to Andrew. The person either has the money or they don't. And it often feels like he's just not able to like, you know, create any possibility, see beyond this. So so super common. Um, Any time, this isn't really a topic. We're not really talking, talking here about a topic about a coach being hired. It may sound that way on the surface, but any time, anyone wants to create anything in their life that is outside of their current possibility, it's going to require something different from them. It's going to require they show up in a different way in their life. It's going to require that they generate something that they never have before. That's the nature of a breakthrough. A breakthrough isn't like, I had this powerful conversation and now I'm just magically doing things differently. That's not the way it works. The way it works is like this conversation, I saw it was available. Now I'm in the process of doing the scary work to actually make that happen. So it's going to require something new from people. And there's going to be a really valid reason why they can't do the new thing. The valid reason, whatever it is, I don't have time. My kids won't let me. My husband doesn't want me to. Uh, my parents are going to laugh at me. I don't want to be a fool. I don't want to invest money that's going to go nowhere. Whatever the thing is, the very valid reason for not doing the new thing is what keeps the person inside this sort of like world that they've created for themselves. This is your world currently with everything that's currently possible to you in it. And everything that you want that's not possible is outside of that little bubble we've drawn. And the excuse, the objection, the reason you can't have what you want is the thing that just keeps you back in this bubble. So it's sort of like you're like, all right, here we go. We're going to leave. We're going to get out of here. This is going to be amazing. I want that thing over there. Oh, oh, back in we go. So any objection is just it's human. That's the nature of a breakthrough that is that we're going to be up against this stuff. So Andrew specifically is talking about the kind of objection when people have money in the way. I don't have the money. What do we do? When someone presents something to you that is a financial requirement, like it costs this much to do this, what do you, dear listener, do with that? Let's have a sip of tea and let you think about it briefly. You can post in the chat if you like. But I'll assert this is what we do. What we do is we look to our bank account, see if there's money there. It doesn't seem to be. Look to our spreadsheet for our budget, see if there's any of that money coming forward. It doesn't seem to be. And then third, maybe we look to like a windfall. Am I scheduled to win the lottery at any point? Any rich uncles dying? Is there any big chunk of money coming through from an inheritance? Once we've looked at those three places, we kind of exhaust all our options. So what 
And that's why people don't get to go any further. Now, if that's how people approached buying a house, no one would ever have a house because you'd look to your bank account. There's no 400, or if you live in Victoria, $6 billion sitting in my bank account. Look to my budget. I don't see any line item in here that says $400,000 for house. Look to my inheritance. Ah, I've got an inheritance company. So the wealthy inheritance people, the trust fund kids can afford a house, but no one else. And yet people afford houses. People live in houses, even those that don't have trust funds. So there's clearly something else going on. And what's going on is that in this context, the way people are relating to a house is that it matters enough to them. It's got enough value to them that they're willing to look beyond those three options. And what they do is they borrow the money. I'm going to borrow that money because the house is worth it. I have a mortgage. I pay money to the bank every month because this house is worth it. I love the house. It's beautiful. So before we go anywhere further, just notice that there's already, hopefully, a shift in the black and white nature of this. Before, it was like, can I do the thing? Check those three spots, yes or no. But now, obviously, there's nuance here because with some things, we are willing to do that. And if a house is a bridge too far for you, look to a car or look to that big screen TV or whatever it happens to be. Whatever it is, there are differences in how we approach this. And the difference, I would assert, is when someone, it's the lens someone's looking at something through. So the lens is affordability versus value. Would you like to buy this lamp? It's $6,000. You're gonna be like, that lamp's cool. It's got like pewter, look at that. Isn't that beautiful? My camera's gonna mess itself up now. You can, you can raise the wick, ooh, you can make it even more fiery and stink up my office. It can light, you could read through it, good lamp. You're gonna ask yourself, hmm, can I afford that lamp? Can I afford $6,000 on a lamp? And even though you haven't done this calculation in your mind, you already have a sense of the value in the back of your head. What is that lamp worth to me? Well, I can just buy a candle and those cost like 50 cents. They don't look as nice as this super cool lamp that Adam's got on his desk, but, and so very quickly, you're gonna go into a conversation about affordability. Can I afford this? Can I afford to throw $6,000 at that? And affordability doesn't look to long-term investment return. It doesn't look to any of that. It just looks to those three spaces we talked about. Do I currently have the money? Is it in my budget as a line item coming down the pipeline? Is it gonna be a windfall? No, 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 nah. I like your lamp, Adam, but no. The conversation about value is one that's fundamentally different. And I'll use a metaphor for you here that I got from the website of a coach that I was gonna collaborate with briefly. I'll just digress for this story. Someone randomly, an accountant reached out to me and Bay and was like, I wanna collaborate with you. I've got this crazy idea. I used to consult with accounting firms. I'd give them all these ideas. They'd never implement them. They were great ideas. They just couldn't implement. I wanna work with some coaches in my retirement and create a thing where you can support them in coaching this so we can make something beautiful. And he brought on this other coach to, um, to like be a part of it too. And so of course I did my diligence. I'm Googling, I'm like, who is this coach? What is he up to? And the guy was pretty cool. I liked a lot of what he said. And on his website, he had a frequently asked questions and it was, uh, oh no, he had something that was sort of like, how do I know if I should work with you or something like that? And the first thing he had, which I loved was, well, here's how I can tell you if you shouldn't work with me. If your first question is, what does this cost? I was like, all right, cool. I like this is a good start. I'm down with this guy standing for his value. And the metaphor he used was like, when you ask, what does this cost? You're looking through the lens of, can I afford it? Without putting any attention on what you're going to get out of it. You, you have not even considered yet what you're going to get out of it. And people do this typically when they have a conversation with a coach that's kind of cool. They like the coach. They have a concept that they should be better. They have a concept that they want something nebulous, like more connection, more love, more presence, concepts. But they don't have any real world clarity on what that would be like in their life, on the experience of having that, on what would tangibly change from that shift. 
They just have concepts and the fact that they like you. So from there, they're not really present to the value at all. They're present to what's this going to cost me and can I afford it? And then his follow up, which is the whole point I brought this digression into the conversation was, on the other hand, if I told you I was selling $100 bills for $80, how many would you want to buy? Now, just think about that. Andrew, if this person realized, if they could see, they told you, look, I looked here, I looked in the budget, I looked to the windfall, nowhere there. And you're like, okay, great. I got a different proposition for you. I've got $100 bills. They're not counterfeit. I don't like $100 bills. So I'm selling them for 80 bucks. How many do you want? The sky's the limit. That guy's going to borrow money. He's going to sell his car. He's going to do everything in his power to get as many of those bills as he can. So notice the distinction there between value and affordability. Now, with the $100 bill, the value, I've got a funny $10 bill here. I bought this in Quebec. It's the devil's bill, they call it, because it's hard to see. But right there, her hair looks like the devil's face. So they stopped printing this. They fixed it. Anyhow, I, I'm not a collector of stuff, but I was like, that's cool. I like that Canadiana. Anyhow, the point is, this piece of money tells us right on it. The value is right there. So it's stark. Whereas with coaching and leadership, it's more nebulous. And with coaching and with a dollar bill, you got to trust the government is going to honor this legal piece of tender. Because if the government one day says, fuck it, we're not going to do this anymore. Your money's worthless. The only reason this has value is because we all trust and agree and act in accordance with the statement that this has value. So there is trust no matter what. It's just that it's been around forever. We know to trust money. When you're coaching someone and drawing value out of them so that you can have that conversation, it requires a lot more trust on their part in themselves and in you. But we always want to check what's the value that they see they're going to create. And once people start to see the value of something, then you can be in a different conversation. Then the conversation can be like, um, well, I'm scared, Andrew. I don't know that if I invest this money, I'm really afraid that I'm not going to be able to make it work. Great. We can work with that. I can support you to move through that because now we're in a conversation about something other than affordability. Now we're in a conversation about like, well, if I got past my trust, how many of those $100 bills, I would want to buy a lot of them. If I knew this worked, I would 100% do it. If I knew I could rely on myself to create those results with your support, I would 100% do this. Okay, great. So it's a different conversation now. We're no longer talking about affordability. We're no longer just looking, well, I checked the bank account five times, maybe a sixth time. No, we've moved into a conversation about value. Sometimes people don't trust us. And that's because we haven't demonstrated value. We haven't coached them. We haven't done enough of our own work or worked with our own coach. That, that's challenging, but you know that's a place that we can do some of the work too. Or we can work with them. Hey, is it that you don't trust me right now? That you're not sure that with my support, you're going to make a difference? And from those places, once people are clear on all that stuff, once they're clear on what's on the table for them really to create in their lives, then the conversation can be like, great, so how are you going to create this money? How will you make this happen? If this really mattered to you, if these $100 bills are on sale, how are you going to get the money to buy them? Then people will start to get creative. When people are present to the value of what's on the table, that dude buying the $100 bills, imagine how creative he's going to get. He's going to be like, I'll sell, I'll sell this lamp to someone. I'm going to go downtown and I'm going to give people water bottles and ask them for whatever. I'm going to sell the shirts that I'm wearing. Like they'll do whatever it takes because they're present to the value. So when you find yourself stuck in that, that's the distinction I would have you practice with Andrew is affordability versus value. And likewise, for any of us where we notice someone getting into the affordability conversation, I'm going to share a little bit about a place where that's shown up recently for someone that's in a conversation with me as well. First, I'm going to read your comments, then we'll come to that. Um, so Andrew, you're saying it depends on the level and type of investment, definitely analyze the perceived value and also trust that I have of that person or opportunity. So true. There are some places that we will get a loan or invest car house vacation. Funny that I never seem to bring that up. Seems like a great place to create awareness from. 
Carol's saying coaching is a non-materialistic product, which is sometimes hard to sell. Plus, we cannot provide real guarantee since the achievement of the goals fully depends on the client's commitment. Absolutely. But again, I just want to remind us that this too is non There is no inherent value in this piece of paper. The only reason this has value is because we say it does. We collectively agree to it. Now, it's easier with money because it's been around for longer than any of us have been here. And that's the story societally we've all bought into. I say for the better. Some people say for the worst. It's also worth noticing this, this is like rated, right? It's got this very fine rating. So the bill's in great shape and you got to keep it in this stupid, ugly plastic envelope, which means you could go to a collector and possibly sell this for more. But it only has that value when someone is willing to pay the money. So again, even though it says fine, very fine 30, that's not inherently valuable either. So I just want to point to, Carol, you're right that coaching is more removed from the value. We have to, there's a little more trust. We have to practice. But I want to be clear that that's no different than anything else in our life that we invest in. There is no guarantee that going to law school would have brought me to this point in my life. There's no guarantee that getting a degree, getting higher education will get you what you want. There's no guarantee that working really hard for four, there's no guarantee that doing the same thing you've done for the next 20 years is going to leave you any more content and happy than the misery it's provided you up to this point, along with all that other stuff. So you're totally right, Carol, but it's, I think, a bit of an illusion we all fall into that like other stuff is guaranteed. I'm not saying that there's not gradients. I'm just saying that it can be a bit sneaky. We can get a little bit caught when we start to hold it like, oh, but it, it, it's, it's not the same. You're right. It does require a bit more trust and we can support the client to create that trust. But at the end of the day, everything we do is ultimately a function of us seeing enough value that we're willing to step beyond our fear and choose into it. The way I work with clients that want to do that is I, I'm very committed to creating that value up front for them. If you are considering hiring me and we have not already transformed your life to some extent, even just by you seeing more possibility, by the time we get into the hiring client, uh, hiring conversation, I've failed you. Andrew, you're saying a thing that is coming up for me in this is that trust in themselves. So they don't trust the value that will create that they will create in the coaching relationship. So will the money be worth it? I've opened their eyes to the possibility, but that may not trust or see it in themselves. Yeah. Some people, the fear is too great. We're not yet willing to trust ourselves. So sometimes depending on what you charge, you know, I charge a pretty high rate. It's a $60,000 commitment. If you want to work with me, that's, that requires a, like, you got to be willing to step over a threshold. You got to be willing to put a lot of trust in yourself to invest that kind of money in yourself, not in me, in yourself. So there's that. At a lower rate, it requires less trust. And the coach has to do less work to support you to see as much value. If a coach is charging $500 a month, that's less value you need to see. At 60K, those clients I'm working with that I'm creating, they got to see a lot of value for themselves and they need some support to see that yeah, I could do this and I'm ready to do this. And then uh, lastly, Andrew, you say to add to my last comment that maybe the possibility we've created together isn't actually worth the investment they see in the moment. Could be a possibility, a place to explore deeper. That's right. Yeah. So sometimes it's that there's not enough value on the table. People don't really see much possibility. Sometimes they've got other stuff in the way. Like they don't, they're not, they're afraid that they'll fuck it up. And, and you haven't addressed that it's showing up like, well, it's too much money. And if you, if you started to look through the lens of value, you might start to get down to, oh, what's really going on is they're scared that they're going to fail. They're going to invest this money and fuck it up. Let's do some work with there. Let's support them with that, seeing how that goes in their life and the habitual way they try to address that and how it doesn't get them what they want. Um, so there's a person recently that reached out, uh, sh someone referred her to me and she reached out to me and uh, she's up to all kinds of cool stuff. Uh, we had a great conversation and in the conversation, I was just trying to get a sense of like, who is this person and what is she up to? What does she want to create in her life? And so it wasn't, I wasn't trying to do anything on this call with her, I was just connecting and, and asking some questions just to get a sense of like, where are you in the world? You know, like, what are you doing? 
How does your life look? What do you like? What's your favorite breed of dog? Is it Boston Terrier? You know, all of these questions, just being human with her, getting to know who she is and sharing anything she wants to hear about me. At the end of that conversation, she was like, I really, this feels good. I've talked to a bunch of other coaches. None of them felt kind of this good. How, what, how do we, how do we proceed? How do we go further? Like, what does it look like to work with you? We're light years away from working together. And the reason that that's the case is because neither of us has any idea, or at least it's not in the space. She may have an idea, but I have no idea. And I haven't heard from her yet what she really wants to create in her life. So this would be a little bit like me getting to know someone and then, then saying, okay, so what kind of mortgage do you offer? 40 years, 35 years, what's it look like to get a mortgage with you? Well, do you want a house? Do you want a condo? Do you just want to rent? What are you up to in your life? What do you want to get to? What do you dream this mortgage will help you create? None of that's on the table. So I could, I could just give her those rates, but you can damn well bet that she's going to look through the lens of affordability there. Oh man, you're cool, Adam, but I just can't afford that. Well, of course you can't. There's no reason for you to afford it. There's no value on the table. There's nothing that would have you go out and get creative to create enough money to buy those $100 bills for me that I'm selling for $80. So with this client, I'm really clear with her. Hey, just to be clear, we are nowhere near a coaching relationship yet. There's more work for us to do. I'm not trying to play a sneaky game with you. It's just imagine if this was not working with me we were talking about, but you making a change in your life. And where we're currently at is we've talked a little bit about what's going on in your life. And you're like, great, what's it look like to make a change in my life? Hold on. What for make those changes in your life? So until we have that, making a change in your life would actually be foolhardy. And looking at what it's going to cost you to make that change in your life is just going to, it's just going to turn you away from it. It's just going to have you be like, oh, I can't make a change in my life. I took a look at what it would require. It's too heavy. I guess I'll just keep doing the same thing. So it could be helpful sometimes to imagine they're not talking about working with you as a coach or a leader. They're talking about creating a change in their life. And then when they're asking, what does it cost? They're really asking, what is it going to require of me to make this change in my life? Do you yet know what the change will be? Do you yet know why they would make that change? Do you yet know the benefit, the, the cool things that are going to happen as a virtue of that change and the, the costs that are on the, on the line as a virtue of not making that change? All of that stuff has to be in the space before we even look at the cost. This, by the way, this isn't coaching. This is just why all of us get stuck is because our default lens is what will it cost me? Not financially, just in terms of our life. I would love to run a marathon, but that would require me to do X, Y, and Z and A, B, and C. And I'm so busy. Look, you haven't even talked to yourself about what might be possible if you run that marathon. You just ended the conversation by getting clear on what it's going to cost you. So all of our attention is on how hard it's going to be to get the thing, which then stops us from even looking at the benefit of getting the thing. So we always put our attention there. We'll see how it goes with her. She's very eager to know what it looks like to work with me. So, you know, there may be a point where I tell her, look, this is what it costs. We don't know why you would even do that, why you would surmount that obstacle. Why would you take that on? My invitation to people in that space is always like, hey, regardless of whether you're interested in working with me or if that cost is blew you out of the water, what I would suggest is you and I have a call where we get really clear on what would be worth that kind of investment in your life. Because then you're going to take that everywhere you go into your life, regardless of whether you're getting supported by me. Then you know what's on the table for you. And that's going to motivate you regardless of what you choose, what kind of structure support you take on. Very few people take me up on that offer. It's because they're scared. They're worried I'm going to try to hire them or they manage my time. Oh, I don't want to make Adam do work when he, I know he's not going to get paid for it. You know, it's all their stuff projected onto me, but that's okay. Okay. Uh, great question, Andrew. Thanks for being that. Let's talk about being a leader versus developing a leadership, not a leadership, developing leadership. So when people are invited into the practice of leadership, there's an idea that they have about what that'll look like. 
I know this because I have led many leadership teams and I've led many leadership teams in environments that, um, how can I put this? They're environments that don't already have like a preconceived hierarchy of what leadership is like, like corporate settings. So more sort of like leadership teams at coaching intensives or for coaching groups or, or stuff like that. So when people are a yes to that, what they believe the practice of leadership for them will be is they're going to develop the leadership of other people. And people really, really like that belief. It's a very juicy belief. And the reason it's so juicy is because I get to be up here helping you get up here. I have achieved amazing heights. And with my support, you young Padwan can also achieve these amazing heights. So there's a innocent arrogance to this belief. And there's a safety to this belief. If I get to be now one of the leaders, my work is kind of mostly done. Maybe I'm just polishing, buffing the statue up a little bit, but for the most part, I'm a finished sculpture, the paragon of leadership. So that's where people believe the invitation into a leadership conversation is. That's where they think they're going to go. I have to be the one to shatter that perception for them. I don't have to. I don't have to do anything. But I end up being the one because I'm a stand for something beyond that. So before we can develop someone's leadership, we first have to put the attention on ourselves. And that's where we start to look at the being of leader. Uh, I'll come to your question in a sec, Carol, because it's a really good one. So what that means is that when you come to me to practice leadership, before you can develop anything in other people, we've got to develop your ability to show up and be, bring the being of leader into the space without you doing anything. Developing someone's leadership is the doing. It's the conversation we have with someone else. It's the um, support we offer them. It's the way we invite them to look. It's the telling them the hard truth. I'm ready for that. I'm tired of not doing that. You know, whatever. All of that sort of floats on top of the more profound work, which is you and your being. And does that being you are currently bringing to the space express leadership? Ruth who asked the question earlier about like the feedback with Judith, as we called her, has been in the forge and she's witnessed a lot of our leadership team be in the awkward practice of having their leadership developed, having the being of leader brought forward. And so when we look to that question where we're looking is, how are you showing up in the moment? Are you open? Are you able to receive feedback and everything else that's coming at you as a leader or are you closed? Are you present to the impact you're having in the room? Where aren't you present? What is the impact of the way you're showing up as you lead this particular thing? As you share some information with people, what's the impact of the way you're sharing it, of the way you're being? Is it having people receive what you're providing them? Or is it having them sort of get distracted and shut down and turn away and do something else? All of this stuff has nothing to do yet with the conversation about developing someone else's leadership. Very um, few people want to really, hold on, let me get the, the right wording here. A lot of people love the idea of developing someone else's leadership because it's totally fucking safe. Very few people love the idea, once, especially once they're in the practice of it, of having their leadership developed. Because having your leadership developed means the spotlight's on you. You don't get to put it on that person who you're developing. It's on you. And only when the light is put on us can we start to realize how uncomfortable it is. We get it intellectually, but it's not until that moment when you're leading something and I say, Ron, I got some feedback for you. Can I stop you for a sec? And then you start to feel this prickle of sweat at the back of your neck and your armpits start to get sweaty and you're like, oh, fuck, I fucked up. Okay, yeah, yeah, I'm totally open to feedback. And then I got to say, you don't seem open to feedback, Ron. Is it okay? Well, I'm nervous. Great. Way to go, Ron. Way to be nervous and to share that. All of this part of the conversation, people don't really want to be in that. We want the glory, but that conversation is really awkward. 
Now we can change our relationship to it. We can work ourselves out so we can have a really empowered relationship around this, but that's not where we begin. Where we begin is, yeah, I'd love to develop the leadership of other people. I would like to be on the leadership team. So this is one of the earliest barriers to people really becoming magnificent leaders is the desire to give, but not receive. We want to give leadership to other people, but we don't want to be on the receiving end of it because we start to discover while we're on the re receiving end of it, how friggin' hard it is to really have it, how much humility it requires, how much opening in the face of our own resistance it requires. And that's really challenging. So the way our leadership team works in the forge is that before anyone's even considered for it, they got to go through as a participant. Um, they got to learn the distinctions we're working with. They just got to be the experience of it. Then the next level, by and large, all they're doing is having their, they're learning how to show up with the being of leader. Here's a really simple example of that. Oh, sorry, my nose is itchy. It must be time to trim the nose hairs. <laughs> sorry, that had to be on the live. Um, showing up late. Now, this probably seems really um, obvious. Just don't show up late. But if it was that easy as just repeating that like a mantra and then not showing up late, well, that'd be great, but it's no issue. But that's not the way it goes. And so we have members on our team because everyone has their own relationship to time where they're booking their calls right up until the very moment we begin. So they kind of show up right on the time. And if they're a minute late, they're a minute late because maybe they had to run to the bathroom or something like that. Well, consider that that has an impact as a leader. If I show up two minutes late, what message does that send to everyone? Now, let's go one step further. I show up two minutes late and I apologize and I'm so sorry for the impact I had. And then everyone's like, okay, cool. That's cool. Adam modeled, you know, owning that. And I show up next week, two minutes late. And I apologize for the impact I had. Okay, cool. Yeah, you did that last time. I remember that. And then I show up next week. I apologize. Okay, now the clearing that I'm becoming as a leader, absent any developing of leadership, absent anything that I'm doing, the, the clearing I'm creating is it's okay to be late. You just have to, you just have to say your story over and over and over again. There's no need for you to clean this up. There's no need for you to do something about it. There's no need for you to actually address this in your own life. So you stop showing up late. All you need to do is just keep apologizing. And so what you will create as a leader are more leaders who show up late and apologize for it without ever actually doing anything which is fine if that is the expression you want in your organization. If the team you wanna run is a bunch of people that show up late and apologize for it, great. But what about being the kind of leader that develops leaders that are able to show up late, apologize for it, but over time, stop that behavior, create the internal transformation and breakthrough that allows them to be on time and to be in integrity with their word. Being on time is part of your word. Imagine being that kind of leader. And imagine you could do it in a way that left people feeling like beautiful and whole and complete and like inspired rather than made wrong and beaten down. I'll do it because I don't want to be hit with a stick. So that's why we have to put our attention on the being of leader. And that's why leadership is so scarce is because our attention, we want to skip right over that work. We want to go straight to doing leadership. I want to develop other people's leadership. And this is also why people believe they can do this stuff without needing their own support without needing a coach, without needing a leader is because as long as I skip over the integral crucial first step of having my own being developed so I can show up as the expression of leader, I never notice that impact. I just get really kind of enamored with the development work I'm doing with my people. Oh, I'm totally developing leaders. Yeah. Well, how's your leadership going? Oh, it's great. I'm really developing leaders. No, no, no. But I mean, like, where are you noticing your blind spots? Oh, well, Sometimes I get nervous giving feedback, but lately I've, I've really like just sort of reminded myself, I don't have to be ne nervous and I'm totally developed. No, you're not in your work <laughs> because if you really were, you'd be able to tell me places like, oh my God, when I start speaking, I get really fast and I get really monotonic and all of my heart leaves the conversation. And then fucking Adam calls me out on it and it's really awkward but I've been learning how to like breathe into those moments and open and I'm starting, that's what leadership being developed sounds like. That's how we know someone's in their work. Not that they use my name, although that helps, 
but that they can distinguish something that's actually happening as it's happening and that has real meat on it. That's not about like, you know, that throwaway, like, oh, sometimes I get nervous, but now I don't. Oh, well, sometimes I'm afraid of being vulnerable. Go on. Well, yeah, I mean, it's just, you know, it's vulnerable stuff leading. So sometimes I, one of the blind spots I notice is sometimes I can get afraid and, and don't want to be vulnerable. That's someone that's very shallow in their work, right? You can hopefully hear there's not a lot of depth to what they're distinguishing. Yeah, no shit. We all get vulnerable, vulnerability hangovers and, and afraid of that. Yeah, we're all afraid of fear. Yeah, we're all afraid of failure. Are you in your work? Can you get a little deeper underneath that? Are you getting supported to do this? So if you have a desire to really deepen as a leader, not a leader that calls themselves a leader, not a leader like just, yeah, I'm a leader, not just a throwaway superficial kind of leader, but really someone that, that gets deep, that transformationally creates leadership in others, bring the attention to your own work. Bring the attention to the development of your being as a leader before you start to look to other people. Andrea saying, this is such a distinction, how hard and how much humility it takes to lead and to be led. Right, Andrea, like to lead is to be willing to be led. And that is really tough. It takes tremendous humility. I'm going to read your comments. And I'm going to come back to what you wrote, Carol. Um, Andrew saying, I'm also way more open to feedback from certain people in my life. and will disregard the feedback of others. Yeah. Kind of like we were talking earlier. Those can, sometimes that's fine, right? Like if you have um, an abusive family member who's got like a borderline personality kind of disorder, you're not going to take much of their feedback on, right? You might, you might listen, but you got to, you recognize I got to do a lot of work to polish this coal down to the diamond that's, that's there. And I'm not going to do that work. So we always, there's the middle path, right? We always want to look, am I dismissing this feedback? Cause it's safe for me to do so. And it allows me to be comfortable. Or is it because there's really a, you know, like this is just not the feedback I'm looking for in my life. And neither of those is right. We're just always looking to calibrate better and better and better. Uh, Andrew, you're also saying I've had a reserved relationship to my leadership being developed. Yeah, me too, brother. <laughs> I get nervous about it and hide at times, but I've been deepening that trust and being more open that the people in my own leadership circle are truly there and want to support my growth, even when it's uncomfortable for me. Yeah, even and especially, you know, those are the, the there's no leadership without discomfort. None. Um, Carol is asking, Adam, do you personally follow up with hesitant prospect clients? Uh, I hate pushy sales. Well, I would never push anyone. So, but I would put them at choice. So those are two different things. Pushing someone is taking away their choice. Hey, are you going to do this thing? Do you want to do this thing? Do you want to do this thing? Putting someone at choice might be like, hey, Ron, it's been a week since we talked. I haven't heard from you. I just want to check in and see what's going on. I might do that. Um, what what I would do, and this doesn't always work for new coaches, but like my I have a lot of people that are coming to me. My my practice is oversubscribed, and so um, and yours may as well. Like in terms of like connection calls, so it may not be in terms of people saying yes to you, but maybe you have just a lot of connection calls, and you're noticing, ah. Huh, I'm not going to just be a yes to everyone at this point. And so when I have people that feel kind of like, eh, I'm not so sure, like they feel kind of hesitant or more like they're wanting some development on their leadership. They're, they're wanting someone to like give them some tips. They're wanting someone that'll work with them for like a month, four sessions for like 200 bucks a session. You know, that's just not the work I do. Right. So, but I'll be in a conversation with them. And if they get in a conversation with me, what I'll tend to do is just give them something to take on. Like, hey, have a look in your life, figure out some of the stuff you want, send me an email. And then if they don't email back, great, right? They probably, that's where their commitment stopped. That was the level to which they were going to engage. And if they do email back, great, I'll probably have the next conversation with them or I might, you know, check their feet. Like, hey, just so you know, I want to be clear that working with me is like a huge commitment. It's not for the faint hearted. This is not making your life slightly better. This is transforming. This is breakthrough work. This is you totally shifting the way you show up in your life so you can be the person you've always been committed to being on this planet. Is that something you actually want? Because that'll require a lot more from you. So that's what I tend to do, Carol. Um, 
I'm never pushing someone into anything because it sucks for me and it sucks for them. And it's just, there's not a lot of benefit that comes from that. Once you can really see the abundance of this work, why would we? You know, if, if there's an abundance of connection and from that connection, an abundance of possibility and from abundance of possibility, there's an abundance of coaching. And from that, there's an abundance of people that want to work with you. Why would we even bother if we could get all that, if we understood that, if we felt that in our bone marrow, why would we bother pushing someone into it? There's just no reason, right? It's a complete waste of everyone's time and our energy, and it creates a miserable working relationship. So from abundance, all of that stuff falls away. There's just no need for it. Okay, being a leader versus developing leadership. We did that. We nailed it. It's time for the leadership lightning round. Let's bring this over here so we can do it lightning. The lightning round are topics I've been um, just throwing together for, uh, what are these for? These are for like TikTok videos, one minute kind of like leadership lightning bolt moments. Um, ma what do I call it? Minute of mastery maybe. The idea is like trying to take a concept as rich and is counterintuitive as leadership and provide something of value in a minute. I'm not going to do these over a minute. I'm just going to work with them. We'll, we'll probably be a little longer, but these are some of the ideas I've had. I'm just going to shoot them out your way. So the first one is hold yourself. If people want to really begin deepening their being of leadership, the first thing that I would have them do, the first tip, the first lightning bolt would be hold yourself with reverence. What most of us do is we are totally irreverent to ourselves, meaning we think of the way you hold something with reverence, like the way you would be in an ancient church you're visiting in Italy that's been there for thousands of years and is gorgeous, as opposed to the way you be with a bag of chips on the ground when you're walking through a country that's dirty. You, you ignore it, you kick the bag of chips, or maybe even throw your own litter on the floor. But in the church, you would never do that. And so we want to be that way with everything showing up for us. Our judgment, like someone, um, someone, a friend of mine, I'd, I'd written, uh, I'm just going to look up the comment she made. I'd written uh, a story on Instagram and she wrote, I can't even remember the context. Uh, Throw your ego in the trash and you'll do great things. You can get the... Hopefully you can get the, the idea behind that, right? Like the well intent, the good intention behind that. Yeah, without the ego, we would just do everything. But that doesn't bring very much reverence for our ego, does it? It kind of holds our ego like this additional leech, this, this parasite attached to me. Throw it in the trash. Everything will be great. Hold yourself with reverence. Hold your ego with reverence. If my ego is showing up here, what's going on for me that would have it show up? And then don't be dismissive in your answer to that rather than just being like, I'm just afraid of failure or I don't know, I'm just lazy. Just listen to the dismissiveness of yourself in that, right? Instead, oh, but what might have me be lazy? What's safe about that? Why would my ego be driving me towards that? Because remember, my ego's job is to help me stay safe. What feels unsafe in this moment? What am I scared of in this moment? If we can bring reverence to ourselves and what's showing up for other people, that will move us far closer to leadership than almost anything else we can do. Boom, lightning bolt. Boom, next lightning bolt. Just a variation on that theme. Love your ego. However your ego is showing up, learn to love it and love other people's ego. When that part of themselves shows up that is like, you know, spiky, like a puffer fish, that's that's kind of like, eh, fuck you. Do the hard work of learning to like, you don't have to hug it. You don't hug the puffer fish like that or the porcupine, you hug it like that. You hold your arms out so it can be here safe without you stabbing yourself. So learn to love the ego everywhere. And especially if you're a coach or a, le a leader, really learn to love the ego. If you are doing any work of value, it will require your client being in a space of their confrontation. One of the things Bay and I are often pointing out when we're evaluating coaching calls is calls that are totally comfortable. 
So the coach is asking questions and the client's sort of like just having these, they're saying stuff and almost certainly the, the client will be like, yeah, oh, that's a really good point. I'm really seeing for myself, something for myself. Maybe they are, but they're totally safe. There's nothing, there's no confrontation happening in the call for the client. And I don't mean the coach confronting the client. I mean the client confronting themselves. I mean the client coming up against something that feels a little edgy, a shift in energy, anything like that. Now, I'm not saying you've got to force people down this path. I'm saying we have to be willing to let this path show up. If I make the ego wrong, every time my client or my direct report shows up with their ego, I'm going to try to push it away or I'm going to withdraw from it or I'm going to shut down. And that's going to have them then shut that part of themselves down too. So we got to learn to love that. Yeah, Carol saying there's this new culture of kill the ego. Well, it can be good counselor sometimes. Yeah, that would be like saying just that'd be like trying to kill any part of ourselves. Like it's here for a reason. We don't want to let it run our lives, but we also don't want to let our brain run our lives. It's our heart that tells us where to go. And so those things sound powerful. They sound empowered, but they really miss the mark. Love the ego. Learn to love the ego. Don't force the smile. That's another lightning bolt. Have you ever had someone say like, hey, why don't you smile or something like that? Don't do that. We don't know what's going on for someone. We have no idea what's going on in their life. And further, who's to say smiling is better than whatever expression is on their face? That's pointed outwards. Now point it inwards. Don't force your own smile. It's not your job to be cheerful. It's not your job to put uh, to paint glitter on a turd. It's your job to feel whatever is there for you to feel. This doesn't mean you wallow in your emotions for 10 weeks or something like that. It just means being willing to be with whatever is there for you to feel, as opposed to having to force a smile onto it. Last lightning bolt, embrace your judgment, release the righteousness. Our judgment is a piece of gold for us. What most of us do is we try to make ourselves non-judgmental. I was on a call, well, I was in that Essence of Mastery course, and one of the coaches said, uh, they're like, yeah, I, I just got to learn how to not have judgment. And then, I mean, I got to work on that. No, no, you can't do that, my love. That's not going to happen. Your judgment is a part of who you be as a human being. It's okay for us to have judgment, just like it's okay for us to have anger and fear and an ego response to those things. It's okay because that's the way we're made up. If we make that not okay, it would be a little bit like, ah, it's wrong that I have facial hair. No, it's not. <laughs> it's going to be problematic if you hold it that way. So it's okay that we have those things. It's okay that we have judgment. So what we want to do is we want to give ourselves permission to have judgment. We want to allow ourselves to have judgment. One, so that we can distinguish when it's there. Because if I'm like, it's wrong to have judgment, I shove it below the level of my consciousness. If I can allow it to be okay, oh, I can notice when the judgment's in the space. And then two, we want to release the righteousness about the judgment. Judgment is only problematic when I make it meaningful. If I look over there and I'm like, that guy looks scuzzy and like a drug dealer. That's my judgment of him. Now, am I willing to acknowledge, okay, that's a judgment that showed up. I'm not going to let that dictate my interaction with him. That's just the judgment that popped into my mind. It's okay that that judgment was there. I didn't manufacture that. That was just there. That was what showed up for all number of fine reasons. My job is to allow myself to be a human being who has judgment and then to notice when the judgment's there and notice when my attachment is showing up and be like, that person looks like a scuzzy dealer and I'm fucking right about it and I'm not going to have anything to do with them. That's where judgments become problematic. So don't, don't not have judgments. Don't kill the judgment. Don't make yourself wrong for having judgments. Don't make other people wrong for their judgments. Practice allowing all of it, and then release your righteousness and your attachment to it. Bam, crook a cow, lightning bolt. I think that's all I've got. Let's see if there's anything else I haven't talked on that I want to touch on. Nope, I think that's everything. So, um, I'm, oh, I'm, I'm leaving shortly to go downtown to get some work done on a tattoo I'm having uh, done. I'll show you. I'm going to show you this, this new ink. Um, I have a sleeve that runs from here down my arm, as you've seen. I've got a little uh, sort of 
fall tree there. I've got uh, the Big Dipper, which is how Bay and I met. We were both in astronomy class, um, in astronomy class, and we both, for an assignment, called out the Big Dipper, and then we partnered from that, and then magic happened. Very romantic. The Big Dipper, of course, has the, it points to the North Star. So we, I set it up so that these two stars point you up to the North Star. And then um, what I'm getting done, this is my undershirt, because it's a bit of a heavy shirt, is a new tattoo. I have to get up a bit so you can see it. Whoa. Which is, uh, this is a boat heading off onto the journey of transformation. So the whole tattoo will be a half sleeve that starts here and comes all the way up my chest. And the idea is this a boat leaving on a, on a voyage. And then as we get up here towards the shoulder, it starts to get very abstract and um, patterned. And um, that represents the part of transformation where uh, nothing makes sense. And you're like, I thought I understood what the color black was and nothing I don't anymore. And I feel like everything that I used to know doesn't make sense and I'm confused and I hate all of this. And then it comes from that shoulder down to my chest where the boat's now returned to harbor, but uh, will look very, everything looks different. And like, there's gonna be some weird moons and the sun will be a different color. And so quite surreal because that's what happens when we return from a transformational journey, so to speak. We create the breakthrough, we return to the same circumstances as before, and yet everything occurs differently to us. So I'll be sitting for about six hours after this. Wish me luck on that one. The, the fun thing about that is um, I don't find, uh, I'm not trying to be tough here, I just don't find getting a tattoo that painful. There's some parts where they're like, eh, that is not a nice feeling. And I've not had like an inner thigh tattoo or something. I can imagine that would suck. But what is challenge, what I find um, tough about the artist I'm working with right now is he, as most of them do, he draws and then wipe. They always wipe to wipe away the blood that comes as they're, you know, it, basically creating a wound. And he wipes tough. And so what happens, you know, when you're, when you're getting a tattoo done, you're basically having... Um, it's almost like you're being flayed a little bit, right? Like the top layer of skin has been scraped off. So you just got this raw feeling and then have someone rub it with a cloth. It doesn't feel that great. Um, the, the person that did this sleeve was a little more gentle with that. So over the course of, of, the, of the sit, it starts to be a little bit like, come on, man, can you go a little more gently? So that's happening. Uh, I'm off to do that. That's right, body art with meaning. All of, all of my tattoos have a lot of meaning. That's, I, I like that. I like to tell a story. I love you guys. I hope you have an amazing weekend. I hope you're getting ready for the holidays just as I am, putting up your tree, going shopping, doing all that cool stuff. Let's turn off our torch. Off he goes. That means that the weekend's starting. Thanks for hanging out, everyone. Thanks for your contributions. Carol, Andrew, Maria, Andrea, uh, Ruth. It's been a treat to get to spend this time with you. We'll see you guys soon. Bye-bye.